Hey everybody, Quantum here, and in this video we're going to be looking at some gameplay for my Azurite Sea Emerald Sapphire deck that focuses around Bend to My Will. So the original video that outlines this deck profile here is linked in the description, but I will say after playing that one match, I definitely need to make some big changes. But the deck did execute on what it needed to do, which is basically ramp into Bend to My Will early and make your opponent discard their whole hand. So let's go ahead and look at that match, talk through the process, and then come back to the deck list and talk about what changes we need to make in order to make this more effective. So we're going to be on the play for this game, which is always really nice. And for a deck like this, it matters even more because you do get to ink first, which means you'll hit ahead on the ink curve before your opponent. Not only do we have that advantage, but we're also ramping. So we have a lot of extra things going for us when we go first in a deck like this. We can see the opponent is on an aggro deck here in Emerald Amethyst. They've got a couple of one drops and that could be a little bit of a problem for a deck like this and why I'm going to have to make uh, a couple of changes to this deck like I discussed at the start of this video. We'll cover that towards the end though. So we play Diablo, take a look at the opponent's hand. Yep, they play a Chernobyl Followers as expected. We're going to go ahead and draw a Gramatala. We're going to ink that and we have two choices to play in the Visions or the Hidden Ink Caster. The ink caster replaces itself, puts an item on board in case we draw into a hero. We also have the popsicle ready to go. We draw into yet another visions. Um, so, you know, we're looking okay. Um, in hindsight, I will say that I will be cutting the hidden ink caster. I don't think it's necessary, and I'll discuss why again when we get to the end of the video. But basically, the new card in this set, the um, sail, the Azurite Sea, is. Similar to what I said about Brawl being like the most impactful card despite it being a common in whatever set that came out and I think it was Ursula's Return. This card for Sapphire is probably the best card like ever, <laughs> um, which is a, quite a statement, but the card is absolutely insane. Um, we'll cover it again when we edit the deck because in my first deck profile I completely skipped over it and didn't put it in the deck list But I obviously made an edit and put this into the deck list here in place of another ramp card I think it was uh, but here you can see me cast it. It costs two. It's inkable I, I draw a card and then I can choose to ink an extra ink for the turn It does have to be an inkable card and I'm here. I'm telling my friend Yeah, because I have the ink caster I can also ink my own inkables if I wanted to we do have the bend to my will though in our hand now We just got to ramp up to it. So we're gonna go ahead and ink and yeah, by the way the ink that you drop with the sail the Azurite Sea is also coming in not exerted so you get that additional benefit as well which is absolutely crazy uh, but here you can see my opponent just putting down some threats here they're going to drop the Lyle and then they're going to double quest there with the Chernobog and the Clarabelle so we're definitely facing down some aggro pressure here um, we're on the fifth ink and we're going to go ahead and play Donald in order to ramp to seven so I do make a little bit of uh, miscalculation here because I, I get confused um, and, and I'm, you'll see why in, in just a second. Um, but yeah, I use all my ink to play the Donald and we're on six ink now, which means we're gonna be able to cast this as the opponent gets to uh, four ink here. So they quest with the Chernobog, they get their lore, they banish it to draw a card because they realize this Donald is now putting some pressure on them if they leave their stuff exerted. Um, Donald, I think, is still a really underrepresented and underutilized card, but I definitely think it'll come good, um, at least in the coming sets for sure. It's just a really valuable card. Quest for two, decent stats, uh, plays good on the five curve, allows you to ramp, you know, it's just an, an overall solid card. So this is what you like to see, right? You love to see this. They play a rabbit and pass turn. I get confused here and think that um, I don't, um, like I didn't, uh, or, or sorry, that I already inked for turn. And I have to play like a popsicle first when I could have just inked and cast the, um, uh, the action to make my opponent discard their whole hand. I guess maybe, you know, you're looking at this, they have four cards in hand, they have three cards on board, they do have a rabbit, which means that when I get rid of the rabbit, they're gonna be able to draw the extra card. So you could argue, if there was a way for me to get rid of this rabbit, I maybe should do that first, force them to, to draw, and then discard their hand. The issue is, I let them develop another turn, right? If I pass back to them. And, you know, if they have something like an Ursula Deceiver, they're gonna look at my hand and they're gonna realize, oh, like he has it in his hand, that's his game plan. He's gonna be casting the bend to my will soon and making me discard my whole hand. So I end up getting a kick cloud kicker here, which is normally gonna be really great, but because the bend to my will isn't a song, if I play the kit cloud kicker, I can't play that and the bend to my will unless I have 10 ink. So bouncing back the rabbit is not great in this scenario um, because they'll just replay it and have it on board, getting extra cards in the process. While I will be discarding them, it doesn't 
advance my like the purpose of what I'm trying to do here. Hopefully you understand what I'm saying. So ideally it would have been nice to bounce the rabbit back with the kit and cast the um, bent to my will, but I can't do both. So here um, I'm going to opt to, I think, play the popsicle. Oh no, I think I'm telling my friend, like I think I inked for turn or something, but you know, looking back at this, I was like, yeah, no, I couldn't have inked for turn because I played Donald and Donald would have got me to six ink, which means I didn't ink for turn because I would I would have been on six ink at the end of the last turn when I played the Donald. Regardless though, just to be safe, I don't know why I was doing this. I played the fishbone, inked with the fishbone just to be safe and to play the popsicle because I know there's been videos that I posted in the past where like I doubled inked in a turn by accident and I definitely didn't want you know that to soil this video. Um, but yeah, you can see here the opponent ends up double singing friends, which is crazy. They've gone through three friends. They play the Ursula Deceiver. So just like I said, they, they do have it. But again, we don't have any songs. Ursula Deceiver is definitely losing some value. It, it used to be one of the most broken cards in the game when it came out in set three. Um, but it's slowly losing value. And uh, we can discuss that in another video as well because the new legendary Maui for Ruby definitely helps to check the new Ursula. So yeah, the opponent kind of knows, okay, he's going to be gunning for discarding my hand. I need to play out whatever I can here and just flood the board. And this is where I understood where I made a mistake in building this deck. As I talked about in the first video, which is again linked in the description, you have enough uh, draw engines that are very powerful in this deck in the forms of the Diablo and the Hero. And yes, Diablo is very susceptible to a lot of removal, but honestly, I think Steel Song is gonna fall off quite a bit in this meta because Red Blue just looks to be an absolute powerhouse. It's probably gonna be by far and away the best deck in the format, um, at least in the early uh, stages. And we can discuss that in another video as well. So my opponent ends up playing the Chromacon, the Emerald Chromacon there, and um, ending their turn. So they pass back to me. I take out the Rabbit with my Donald. Take, uh, for, they, they opt not to draw. Uh, and then they choose to bounce back my Donald. Now, I end up using all of my ink to cast the Bent to My Will, making my opponent discard their hand, leaving them with three characters on board. They top deck an Ursula Deceiver and pass their turn. What's really apparent if you're, you know, in the meta of this game is that they have a bunch of small creatures on board. And what would have worked really well, which I'm not running in this deck, and I talked about why I wasn't running it, which I now realize is a huge mistake, um, their board is very susceptible to an Under the Sea. And that is definitely a card I think you need to be running here. So like I was talking about earlier, I will be cutting the hidden ink casters and putting in ice blocks um, because you know it's, it's basically a one for one trade there. I have enough to get rid of the extra copies of Bent to My Will if I do see them, right? Like I said, the Tipos, the Fishbone Quills um, and discard for Diablo Shift. But because of the Diablo draw and the Hiram draws, I'm likely to see and sit on something like um, uh, an Under the Sea that I'll hopefully be able to sing with things like the Donald um, and the Hiram and the Gramatala, whatever's on board in, in combination in order to just wipe up my opponent's field. If I had the Under the Sea, I can even hard cast it in this scenario, right? My opponent would be on absolutely nothing, right? Um, but because I am playing a very low character count and I'm relying basically on Donald and, and Cricky to, to quest for me, which I do have in my hand to be fair, but I just can't develop the board well enough in order to get them to stick and, and have an impact. It's just not going to be enough to deal with what the opponent already had on board. And to be fair, my opponent is on an aggro deck, but this is definitely a deficiency in the deck. So maybe against a slower deck, like uh, a Sapphire ramp deck, you, you could get away with a build like this without the Under the Sea. Um, but again, playing another high cost uninkable action slash song isn't necessarily all that bad because you have ways to ink them if you need to and or use them with the Diablo discard, right? So I definitely think you need to play Under the Sea. The Ice Blocks will help facilitate that. And Sapphire also has a lot of cards that are able to reduce strength. Um, I don't know if you need to play those necessarily. There's a new one in set six. There's like the uh, Minnie Mouse from the previous set, Shimmering Skies. That's a one drop on Inkable, but I don't think you play that either. Um, there's a couple of things to experiment with, but overall, I think the Ice Blocks might be doing enough. Since warded characters are generally very weak, here you can see my opponent dropped the uh, new card added to his uh, aggro deck in the new Goofy, which quests for three and gives war to a creature. And I'm just like, yeah, man, if I had Under the Sea here, I would have wrapped this up so easily, but I don't. I'm forced to use my Cricky early, use the Hiram to just stabilize the board, get rid of a couple of threats. But my opponent is just playing off the top and that's enough for them to win. Um, here I lose the, uh, you don't talk about Bruno, which would have been nice to use 
um, in order to bounce a, and, and discard a threat like that Goofy if he doesn't give itself ward. But right now there's just nothing I can do here. So yeah, the opponent only needs three more lore to win the game. I have to out the Goofy, which quests for three, as well as two other characters, and then they still quest up to 19 anyways, and they probably top deck a character, if not a goat, because they're on Amethyst, to win the game. So yeah, there's nothing we can do here. We definitely needed to see the Under the Sea, and you can see, like, once we discarded the opponent hand, they're playing off the top. We have Hiram's, we have Diablo now, like, we can stabilize very, very easily and, you know, make our way back into the game and flood the board, and the opponent only being on what was it like four ink or five ink or something when i cast the bend to my will because we did get our ramp and again this deck has a lot of ramp in order to focus on getting that bend to my will discard off early they're not going to be able to play their top decks as well right if they top deck their high cost removal they, they can't play be prepared and things like that right uh, because they just don't have the ink so they're going to be drawing into dead cards which means that if you draw into all the other copies of bend to my will you can force them to discard those as well but you'll probably be winning the game before they can do anything meaningful anyways if you're playing a deck the correct way building it the correct way um, so that's going to wrap it up for this match we did lose it but we learned a very valuable lesson let's go ahead and jump into the deck edit now all right so we got to take our lessons learned and edit this deck list now i could spend like an hour talking through some of these choices and, and the thought process here but i'm going to do my best to keep this as succinct as possible um, for our one drops, you know, the Diablo and the Popsicles, I think, are fine. Like I mentioned, we're going to be cutting these in casters and going with the ice blocks. I think that's definitely what we're going to have to do. Um, do you play four or can you play three? I think normally you could play three. Uh, okay, I was like, why does it say one? But it, yes, it's three there. It's, it's hard to otherwise justify playing that many because if you see like two or three really early on they just have no impact you really only want to see one maybe two by the mid game in order to proc the ability to actually have some significance here but if we filter by items what other items could we play for the hero engine you know we got some new emerald items in these uh big hero six items which i've never seen that movie but uh, my wife has and she says it's decent um we've got this transport pod Move a character to the location for free, which is interesting. We don't care about the Prince John Mirror. Um, this Obscura Sphere is interesting. This signed contract is also interesting. Again, limited cards with limited utility. We could opt to say play Emerald Chromacon, but we don't have that many characters to really benefit off of a card like that. Um, the Vision Slab is interesting to floodgate certain decks, air quotes, with the damage counters not being able to be removed, but again, very niche application. So not too much to really get here. The Stolen Scimitar is interesting as well. Um, let's see. Like, again, we don't play enough characters to benefit off of Great Stone Dragon. I think Lucky Dime is not a great card in this deck. We wouldn't play Maurice's Workshop. Uh, you could opt for a Fang Crossbow. This could be an interesting card to play because it's kind of like an Ice Block, but you have to pay for it, but it is inkable. And in certain scenarios, the extra one strength reduction um, could matter for singing under the sea. So this would be a decent option as a one of maybe, just so that we don't end up cluttering up too much with ice blocks in the opening hand. Um, I think that's good. And that keeps us at our 12 items here. So that's good. Next thing we've got to include the under the sea. So like I just showed you in that matchup, being able to clear an opponent's board after you've um, bend to my will discarded their hand is very good now i think most people would opt to play three i'm going to play four um, and that puts us at 66 cards so the mother gothel while it is good i think it is a little underwhelming um while paying five for her ability isn't really anything in a deck like this that ramps so much the issue is you know you still have to pay ink to play her so if you play her that's taking up a lot of your ink for the turn limiting your further interactions versus something like singing a mother knows best which you can bounce a card back to your opponent's hand, then hard cast the um, bent to my will in order to discard the card you just bounced is even stronger. The issue there, of course, is that you're running even more uninkables. So the Bruno and the You're Welcome kind of fill that role in being your your outs to bigger threats post bent to my will, or even you know with You're Welcome singing it, and then after they've drawn their two off the You're Welcome, bent to my will discard their whole hand. 
Um, the Under the Sea being a Sing Together card is, is relevant. Obviously, we don't have singers in a, an ink pairing like this. So that's why something like playing Grammatalas um, is useful, being a body that can replace itself in a decent stat line. I was looking through the four cost cards and there was nothing really else that I think would benefit in, in this slot more than the Grandma. Um, but yeah, I mean, being able to sing with Grandma, Diablo, and maybe just another low cost character like a Tipo or something is, is nice. We're down to 63 cards though, so we do have to cut some things in order to make this more efficient. And again, you can see like on the character count, we're very thin because yeah, these, these actions, you know, they're just, the deck is based around the bent of my will and it is, and it, and it is very powerful. The vision and the sail, I think are staples. Like I think you have to be playing these. They're just, they're just too good not to play. Like the, the visions is technically a tempo loss card, right? Because you have to pay two ink. But again, in a deck where you're able to get your ramp off, it's very inconsequential. But I do think one other thing this deck is lacking in addition to, we definitely need the Under the Sea for our board removal. Like you can also opt for Let It Goes, but I think Brunos are just better anyways. Um, but we're missing a hard like hitter, a hard game ender. Um, so we, we cap out at five cost characters. And if we switch this over to characters, let go of the, oh yeah, cost on five. Like there's nothing really here that we would opt to play that would benefit the strategy. I thought about including Pete just because he's a ward character that could potentially get up to uh, four lore to quest with, but I just don't think that's overly realistic. Being a five cost character with ward is nice because it means he's protected in order to sing our songs that we need him to sing. Um, you don't need to play the Lucifer or the Bell, of course. There's nothing really else in the five cost slot that I think really catches my eye. This Cusco is interesting, but again, like, you're not going to really want to use him as a singer because you're going to want to quest with him. Uh, but the nice thing about Cusco is you can use, um, oh no, Kit Cocker says opposing character, so you can't bounce itself, which is unfortunate. Um, this Baymax is interesting. But again, he'd be better off in a red blue deck where you have more, more, you're more prone to damaging your characters. The King Candy is also a decent card, but again, being uninkable really hurts. And we'd probably want to play the one drop um, shift target as well, which we don't have room for. So nothing really in the five cost slot. In six, none of these are really all that relevant for this build here. The John Silver is always nice. The Lady Tremaine only quests for one, but recurring in action is really nice. Playing an aerial is an option, but it is a huge risk because if we do run into other Sapphire decks that just play more items than we do, like the aerial is absolutely useless, right? Um, the Gaston is good again, but being that uninkable high cost card just really hurts. Honestly, like playing a card like Robin Hood might be the way because he's inkable, he's got a decent stat line, he quests for two, and he has a nice little extra ability of having evasive during your turn. Of course, he replaces himself, right, with the draw card. So. There is that. The Scar here, set one, giving negative five to something could also be very relevant because that will definitely open up the line to get under the seed with whatever you, you know, you, you drop Scar, you you sing under the sea, whatever you just gave negative five to is gone, right? So definitely really relevant there. But I just think he's not as much of an impact card as you'd want him to be in order to justify him. Because um, basically he's just a, a worse version of Kita, right? With Kita affects everything and doesn't target, so it gets around Ward. Scar does not, and that can be an issue. But again, Warded characters are usually weak enough to get under the seed anyways. Um, in the seven drop slot, obviously we wouldn't play Clarabelle because we're aiming to absolutely decimate the opponent's hand. I thought about this Milo, but then you'd have to play like Morph, and then you'd want to play more shift targets in order to get the value off the Morph. So there's a whole package that comes along with that. You wouldn't play the one drop Milo. It's just not worth it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard to really find the, the path. Let me know in the comment section if you made it this far what you think. But yeah, we're on 63 cards. We're only on the, the uh, three typos as our two drop. But you know, we have these for two drops. Maybe you can argue you'd cut, I mean, I think, I, I mean, the draw off the Azeret Sea just makes it better than the Tipo, right? So I think this is actually fine. Like yes, Tipo you can ink an uninkable, this one you can't, but this draws you a card. It's so much more valuable. So maybe you cut a Visions, which feels really bad. Like, again, my Yu-Gi-Oh! players cutting a Pot of Prosperity if you can run the maximum amount. Like, that sounds crazy, right? Um, so yeah, it, it's really hard to, to figure out what the best 
line is then once you get past seven like it just starts to get not worth it like you wouldn't be playing tamatoa you would not play this john silver cheshire cat you'd want the shift for same with genie although you may play an action with five cost or less for free so you can play one of these for free again not too impactful mufasa it doesn't really have a place in this deck although you could say you could fit him in if you wanted to but it's not worth it in my opinion um these guys here this one doesn't matter prince philip shift yeah you're not really getting too much value off of this banishing the damaged characters because you're not you're not a steel based deck this card shift six okay not relevant for our deck at all a 610 though interesting and yeah we don't play enough to value off of the sheriff or the triton so and it's just too expensive so yeah i don't know we need to refine it some more we need to definitely cut some cards maybe you do have to cut it under the sea because again, you're really only aiming to like, you know, you can cut maybe one of each of these, Bend to My Will and Under the Sea, because they both kind of function as wipes, right? Like wiping your hand, wiping your board. Um, so yeah, maybe you could get away with that if you're still running four visions, because this can set you up into these. But yeah, it's it's a hard sell. So we're, we should be on 61 now. Yeah. Um, but again, we still suffer from what is our character to close out the game? Like, you can argue that if you're playing Under the Sea, you don't need to play uh, Cricky because the Under the Sea will do the job that Cricky is, is meant to do, where Cricky beefs up your field, which may or may not be existent, and you can then use your characters to take out whatever your opponent has, which is not great because you'll likely be trading out your cards for your opponents, whereas the Under the Sea just gets rid of them all for free, assuming they're under the two strength. So yeah, maybe the play is to cut Cricky and includes another closer in the deck that might be a little bit better um i don't know we've got to give it some more thought got to play test it some more but i definitely think um replacing the um hidden ink caster with ice blocks and putting in the under the seas is absolutely mandatory uh we need to test some more with this deck and then go from there so i'm going to wrap it up let me know what you think if you made it this far in the video thank you again for watching quantum is out